to this week's episode of MATC Now. With the future of manufacturing at their fingertips, we'll see how the manufacturing program is preparing their students for their future careers. We'll also be checking in with Joe to see what they have growing on over in the Mequon Horticulture Program and learn how we can all be kinder to our planet. Finally, Chef Rex is in the kitchen again as he's going to show us how to bring mom's cooking home with some homemade spaghetti. I can taste it from here. All this and more coming up on MATC Now. Hello and welcome to another episode of MATC Now. Since we've been on a break for a bit, Earth Day has passed, but we're still here to celebrate all things green, from how to save it to how to appreciate it. But with me today is Brian Kenny, who is a tutor here at MATC. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining me this morning. Happy to be here. Well, good, I'm glad to have you with me. Um, we'll go over a little bit about what you do in the department and more, but first, let's take a look at what our field correspondent, Joe Keefe, has in store for us at the Mequon campus. What do you have for us, Joe? Hello and thank you. I'm your field correspondent, Joe O'Keefe, for MATC Now. And roses are red, violets are blue, and I got some information about greenery coming right at you, coming up in just a moment. That looks so exciting. I can't wait to check in with you later to see the full extent of the horticulture program. The Mequon Nature Preserve is educating students of all ages by appreciating the natural environment. Let's take a look. Restoration, exploration, and discovery are three main words to describe the Mequon Nature Preserve. There's so much fun to our planet that we often overlook or are just not aware of. Dedication to nature fuels the staff here at the preserve, a dedication that should be shared amongst everyone. I love the Mequon Nature Preserve for really everything it is. I think, I think it's such a beautiful beginning that it was this gentleman's dream to protect land. I think it's beautiful and incredible that a community came together to put a lot of funding in place to purchase these farms and to make it happen. I think it's just a beautiful story of how many hundreds of thousands of children we've educated for free for all these years now. I love absolutely everything that Mequon Nature Preserve is. Mequon Nature Preserve really began from a dream in 2000 from a gentleman who lived across the street and said, hey, I want to protect that land. A nonprofit and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation came in and became this beautiful partnership. Um, Mequon Nature Preserve actually kind of was almost like a spinoff, really. We, we started in 2011. I think our biggest perk is that we're free, so there's no barrier, so everyone should come and enjoy. The Mequon Nature Preserve has a plethora of programs and a wide range of activities for students of all ages. And it's not just the students. The staff themselves have their very own activities they participate in. For our little bitty ones, we do a lot of it, you know, it's all in-house, where we do the story times, the craft times, the hiking groups. For elementary, middle, and high school, we work side by side with those teachers to design kind of what they need. What the beauty of Mequon Nature Preserve is we're so young that we can kind of be nimble with what we do. So we work with the teachers to make sure we're hitting state standards on what they need to do in their classrooms. And then we come on the land and we build a program around them. As it relates for college students, we're restoring the land together, so we're having those college students get their hands dirty, learn how to do this, and, and know that they can do it, and they're making a huge impact. And then often they're getting class credits, or we have paid internships, or they're getting internship credits. There's a variety of ways in which we can work with those students. Whether it's hiking and biking, walking your dog, as long as it's on a leash, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, joining in some of our field trips via the school system, or coming to story time and craft day here. Um, we have also seasonal programs where we do like a winter frolic and everyone comes and plays outside from building snowman to snowshoeing to ice fishing. There is so much to do here. It's, there's quite a plethora. I think um, my ultimate favorite memory of, of 16 years here 
is uh, from a long time ago. And it's one of the reasons I still keep coming back, if you will. Um, I had a group of children and they came out for a tour and we were running out on the trails and all of a sudden we got, we got through the forest, we were exploring, we were having fun and they were going towards the tower. And they started screaming and screaming and screaming. And I was like, oh my God, they totally found like a snake or something. Shoot, you know, they're gonna be afraid. I don't want them to be afraid. So I got running up to them. And I was like, what are you guys screaming? I'm looking around for the snake, you know. What are you guys screaming for? And they're like, what's that noise? And I was like, the noise? What do you mean the noise? They're like, what's that noise? It's bothering us, what's that noise? And I had to pause and I had to realize that they were talking about the sound of crickets. And I was, I was enamored. And I it kind of thought, you know, it made me do a lot of deep thinking that, you know, of course, because these children were hearing different sounds in the city and they hadn't necessarily heard the sound of crickets. So I loved how powerful of a moment that was. And then I also loved giving them all little crickets to hold and look at and pass around and realizing how beautiful that little creature was too. So they walked away not being afraid of the sound of crickets anymore, but loving it. And that keeps me coming back. Kids need nature, and so I'm gonna help give it to them. <laughs> if you are interested in the outdoors, have a love for nature, or even want to help participate, the Mequa Nature Preserve is here to educate and enlighten your experience, giving students appreciation and love for the natural environment. Nature is an important aspect of all our lives. I appreciate all that goes, uh, all the effort that goes towards its preservation and education. Oh, I agree. Now it's time to go back to Joe and learn more about the horticulture program and to see how you can make your yard blossom this year. I bet you're having a great time over there, Joe. All right, so we'll check back with you later. We're having just a little bit of difficulties. So we'll definitely get back and to learn more of those tips. And I know I'm gonna take some of those tips he's gonna give me and I'm gonna run with, over to my parents' house to help them with their garden and yard this summer. Now let's take a look at the manufacturing department and learn about the different types of experiences students get to achieve. MATC's Manufacturing, Construction, and Transportation Pathway offers several skilled trades that will lead students into important careers that are needed all over our nation. Let's learn a little bit on what the department has to offer. We offer several programs here at MATC uh, specific to manufacturing, construction, and transportation, such as air conditioning, HVAC, uh, power engineering, carpentry, cabinet making, woodworking, uh, welding, uh, automated building systems. So a lot of these programs all consist of things that help in the society as well as residential as well. It's a tie into all of them. So a lot of them relate with each other. We offer refrigeration classes. We offer electrical classes. We offer math classes. A lot of projects that we're currently working on is having a lot of service learning experiences. So moving on in our programs, we're gonna offer a lot of internship, off the field type of experiences so students could get a feel of how it actually is on the job and have that awareness of what to expect and have a more focused training specific experience while they're here to get them a job that their ultimate goal is at. They'll learn to use refrigeration gauges, vacuum pumps, meters, normal hand tools, micron gauges. As a growing city, it is important to make sure our future manufacturers learn skills in maintenance, repair of appliances, building systems, and electrical work. Future students should know that this, our training is very similar to a job format. So students are coming in and the schedule setup that we have for the training is very similar to a job. So we really wanna get students prepared for the career essentials, because as I mentioned, these programs go quick. Some of them are less than a year. So we wanna get them trained and get them ready to transition into the workforce. Would they do a brazing project and a soldering project? Students really like the, the hands-on portion of it. 
you know, putting gauges on, interpreting what that uh, system is doing, uh, building their own system from ground up, putting a compressor together with an evaporator, condenser, meter device, put it together, uh, pressure test it, evacuate it and charge it up and get it running. They, they really get accomplishment of uh, putting the whole thing together and you know, calling it their own. One thing the instructors do is has a good collaboration approach with the Pathway Office. So the MCT Pathway Office is close by. Most of our students stop by and they're referred to us to get that service need to make sure they have the coaching support and the advisor support to help with their outside needs to make sure they have a comfortable experience on campus. Uh, we always make sure we meet the student where they are and we always advocate for their success. So I believe that collaborative approach with the Pathway Office has gone a long way and beneficial for the student success here. Some hands-on um, practical finals that they'll end up doing and in written finals. Uh, so through the whole year we're getting them to uh, get to the end where they can do the practical finals and the uh, written finals. One thing that inspires me is the team that I have. Uh, we have a very good team of SSLs, which is Student Success Liaisons, Pathway Advisors, and Retention Coaches, where we all collaborate and use our uniqueness and skill sets to provide that better experience for the students. So I really enjoy my team. I really enjoy my dean, who is Becky Alsup. She does a great job of overseeing our daily duties and making sure that we're student-focused, because that's really my inspiration, the student focus and experience that they have while they're being advised by me, are being recommended of courses, things of that nature. I feel like I have a very important part of their future and with that responsibility, I take ultimate pride and make sure I perform at the best of my ability. Make sure to check out the Manufacturing Pathway for more information. Road salt. Necessary in the winter when ice-covered roads and sidewalks make for slippery travel conditions. On the worst days, we need it to get to and from work, to drop off the kids at school in the morning, or in the evening to pick them up. But some experts in our community are saying that road salt is becoming a growing problem in our local lakes, rivers, and streams. My name is Lexi Pasante. I'm a graduate research assistant here in the McClellan Lab at the School of Freshwater Sciences. My research primarily looks at chloride pollution by using bacteria as potential biological indicators to determine if a stream or river is impaired of chloride or not. We learned from Lexi that unfortunately road salt doesn't just go away after it gets applied. Road salt pollution comes from stormwater, and stormwater is basically the water that touches the impervious surfaces like our concrete in the cities and moves directly into the sewer systems that do not get properly treated like our wastewater treatment plants do. So when we're applying road salt in the winter, what's happening is when we have these big snowmelt events, all of that road salt is going directly into the sewer systems that ultimately discharge into our bodies of water, so streams, rivers, and lakes. And so that's where the big source of this chloride pollution comes from here in our snowy climates. We also asked Cheryl Nen, who works with Milwaukee Riverkeeper, about the long-term ecological impacts of salt pollution in local freshwater ecosystems. What she told us was quite concerning. There could be long-term impacts on, on, you know, from the base of the food chain to the, the fish, the smaller fish that eat the, the invertebrates or the critters on the bottom of the, uh, on the bottom of the river to the larger fish that eat the smaller fish. So, I mean, there really could be widespread um, ecological impacts. What we're seeing now is kind of more severe impacts to smaller streams where that salt is really concentrated. But you know, as we just continue to, to send more and more salt in, into the environment, there are people that are testing salt even in Lake Michigan, which is this vast lake, right? Um, and Lake Michigan too, we're seeing increasing um, salinity levels in the lake. So that eventually, you know, if it would continue, could impact a lot of freshwater organisms that they might no longer be able to live in places like the Milwaukee River or Lake Michigan if it continues to get more and more salty. With that gloomy scenario, we only had one question. What is there to do about this? 
Yeah, there should not be any piles of salt anywhere. And, and sometimes that is a, a easy problem to fix. You know, uh, the calibration of the, of the trucks matters a lot. And a lot of um, cities used to calibrate their salt trucks like once a year. And they really need to calibrate them almost like daily. You know, I think a lot of education of the public of why it's important to minimize salt. So their levels of service, I think, can really be changed in a way to vastly minimize the amount of salt product that's out there. I never knew how big of an impact road salt pollution was to our environment, but I'll definitely take the time to learn more about it so I can help prevent it as well. But speaking of learning, let's talk more about our tutoring co-host, Brian Kennedy, to see what he does to help students. So Brian, tell me a little bit more about you and your expertise. Sure, I'm a, a tutor in the TV and EPROD production um, programs. I was a student uh, myself uh, just last year, so I just graduated last year um, uh, from the television and video production program. Uh, EPROD, I did take classes in, so I tutor in that as well. Um, but yeah, so I've been, you know, now working in the, the industry as well and kind of tutoring here part time. So. Of course. So how did you become a tutor? Uh, so I just reached out to the tutoring department here and just said, um, you know, you know, I know that you guys are looking for one. There was only one um, uh, tutor at the time. And I was like, I'm, usually there are two. And so I just reached out to them and said, hey, I'm interested. So um, okay. yeah, the office is right down in the C building. Um, you can just go in there, real easy people to talk to. So. Yeah, sounds very simple. So how can you make an impact as a tutor? You know, I think the biggest impact is on uh, just getting students comfortable, especially first year students, people just coming into the program uh, where they're very inexperienced. And I think, especially in this program, um, you know, the, the equipment and the whole thing is kind of intimidating. So a lot of students haven't been in, uh, you know, a TV studio before coming here. Um, you know, and so as, as enamored with it as they are, maybe when they first come in, it can also be a little bit scary because this is stuff that, you know, they've never touched before. So um, that's one big thing. And then also just computers. I mean, I think the biggest thing I end up do, helping students with is just kind of troubleshooting, you know, computer programs. Um, just, you know, they're, they're a kind of a constant problem. So. Yeah, of course. So what's your favorite part about tutoring here at MATC? You know, I, I'd say that it's uh, just kind of seeing uh, kind of that moment that students get it, you know? I think that's probably the thing for all teachers in a way, but you know, you're, you're kind of working through the problem, the, the trouble they might have, and, and you'll sometimes see students who get really frustrated with a particular problem, whether it's writing or, um, you know, just a, a concept in editing or something like that, and you know, they may have heard it in class and they didn't quite get it, and then they come to me and say, you know, what, you know, what does this mean? And sometimes it's just trying to find the way that they understand it and, and kind of stepping back and saying, what do you know about this? And sometimes just having them talk it out, you'll kind of see the light go on in their brain of like, oh, I already know how to do this or I was thinking about it all wrong and now I get it. So that's kind of the best part. Of course, I mean, that me as a student too, that's always a good feeling when like I get that light bulb moment. So yes, you're right. That is very inspiring and impactful for a student and for a tutor as well. So for students that are looking for you as a tutor, what is your availability through the week? Yeah, so uh, us tutors, um, we're generally part-time. So, you know, usually work around 15 hours depending on our schedule, mm -hmm. um, 15 to 20 hours a week. And uh, so for me, I'm usually in the labs, you know, at, you know, um, and I think in the TV program, and it's very computer focused. You got to do a lot of editing. Um, so I'm generally there. That tends to be where students need the most help when they're on campus. A lot of our program is out shooting in the field and things like that. So I can't necessarily go out in the field with them. But I'm here to make sure they get the footage in and, and you know, help them troubleshoot the you know, problems they might be having, just getting it sorted and, and whatever. So. All right. And really quick. Could you tell me, a student who really wants to become a tutor now, how could they become a tutor? Yeah, I think it's great for any students interested, you know, just reach out to the tutoring department. Um, you have to have uh, passed the class that you're tutoring for, um, but, you know, I, and I think maybe, you know, got good grades in it, obviously, to be a, a tutor for it. But I think you can just reach out and just say, hey, I'm interested in doing this, and they'll see if they have a spot open for you. Of course. Thank you so much for showing me and the audience here of how you've become a tutor and how your expertise has really benefited students here at MATC and more. So thank you for okay. sharing that information. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get to cooking, we're going to go right back to the remote to see what Joe has for us at the horticulture program and learn more about those tips I was telling you about earlier today.
Hello, and yeah, I'm down at the uh, I'm down at the North Campus here talking everything greenery with Joe, the uh, forest sculpture uh, instructor. Now, tell us a little bit about what's going on here, man. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming to to campus. Uh, so we've got uh, a landscape horticulture program. We've got an associate degree, uh, a technical diploma, and we've got uh, a handful of, of badges as well. Um, the horticulture industry has a lot of different areas you can go into, mm -hmm. and so uh, we try and give the students the option to kind of pick and choose their, cat, their classes to kind of match what they want to go into. What are some projects they do in the horticulture uh, department? Yeah, so we're really lucky to have uh, many acres of outside grounds here at the Mequon campus to use as our classroom, and so we will use that to plant stuff, to take care of plants, uh, to install retaining walls, pavers, um, you know, do landscape designs for certain areas, to, to climb trees and prune mm. trees. We do all that stuff yeah. right on campus. And uh, what are some of the things that they can do afterwards for jobs? Sure. Uh, so our students can go into a lot of things. Uh, they can become a landscape designer. They can become uh, a crew leader for um, a landscape installation company, a landscape maintenance company. They can go into become an arborist. Um, they can go into working for a production uh, service, like a, a greenhouse where they actually grow the plants that we put in the landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I see you have some designs here. Would you like to tell me about these? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm really kind of proud of our landscape design program. Uh, we've got three courses in landscape design. The first one being uh, a fundamentals course that all of our students have to take if they're going through either the associate degree or the technical diploma program. The designs we're looking at here are from our uh, advanced classes where uh, the students learn specific skills for being a landscape designer, like uh, presentation techniques. So these are colored landscape designs. Uh, some of these have uh, perspective view drawings where they're actually kind of showing what it would look like in person if you were at the site. Yeah. So like the first course is more introductory and the second one's more architecture and like um, writing and coloring? That's correct. So the first course, we just want to have every student who goes through the program, even if they're going into maintenance or construction or board culture, to have a, an idea of the fundamentals of design so they can do their job better. Mm -hmm. And then these advanced courses, you're right, uh, they are picking out specific plant species uh, based on the, uh, the, the, the cultural conditions of the area mm -hmm. um, and, and the functional need and the aesthetic need for, for the site. Mm -hmm. And then learning how to draw graphics, color the designs, uh, and label the designs nicely to make nice kind of professional looking landscape designs. Mm. And I see you also have a greenhouse over here. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, we're really proud of our greenhouse. We, uh, every semester we have a greenhouse class that grows plants for our plant sales. So for anybody who's interested, we have plant sales every fall and every spring, including one coming up uh, in May, where we sell all kinds of plants. And um, we also use those plants in the landscape. Uh, around campus for our classes to to install. <laughs> that sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm gonna have to stop by and buy some of these plants one of these days. Yeah, please do. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> good talking to you, man. Uh, back to you in the studio, Courtney. Thanks, Joe, and thank you for sharing those wonderful tips and all the good things that the horticulture program has to offer. Now, I don't know about you, but I am so hungry. Apparently, Chef Rex is cooking up a familiar favorite. And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, then you must be craving spaghetti just like I am. Chef Rex, show me what you got. Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to make mom's famous spaghetti? Would you capture it or let it slip? That is the question that I, Chef Rex, intend to answer today. And all I need are these simple ingredients. So I've got right in front of me, one package of spaghetti noodles, one onion, a package of ground beef, a can of diced tomatoes, tomato sauce, and tomato paste, garlic powder, Italian seasoning, and finally, Last, but certainly, certainly not least, Parmesan cheese, because mamma mia, I love me some cheese. And remember, as always, before you do anything in the kitchen, make sure to wash your hands. Now, we've got our ingredients all in front of us. The first thing you wanna do is to grab a large pot filled with water, set the stove temperature on high. Once the water hits the boil, let the noodles sit in there for about 10 to 12 minutes until the noodles are nice and tender. You can go a bit shorter if you like to make the noodles more crunchier be my guest, the wool is yours. Now, in the interest of saving time, I've cooked the noodles in advance because 
This is cooking with Chef Rex, not waiting for pasta to boil with Chef Rex. Next, you're gonna grab a handy saucepan and spray the bottom with some non-stick cooking spray or oil or anything you want, butter. Put it on a stove on medium heat. Once you're finished with that, you can move on to making the sauce. Once your pan is oiled up and ready, you can start making your sauce. So we can begin with chopping an onion. Now for you folks at home that don't know how to chop an onion, now this looks like a job for me. So everybody, just follow me. Just uh, wanna slice it vertically like so, one direction. Now, onions are like ogres, they have layers. So once you go that way and then turn it 90 degrees, rotate it and cut it the other way, as you can see, they are automatically diced and that's all thanks to mother nature. Thank you, nature. So I'm gonna finish dicing these onions. You don't have to put too much. I'm not a too big a fan of onions. I think they're too uh, bitter and uh, acidic, but uh, I'll put in as much as I want here. That's nice, it's a bowl. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in a bit later. But I've got some ground beef here. So you wanna take your ground beef and empty that package into the saucepan. You can use a wooden spoon or a spatula to make sure to break up those beef chunks. Unless you like your beef chunky, in case you're free to do it. Now, once more, I've already completed this, uh, just for the pretty interest of saving time. And now you can throw your onions in and stir away. I'm gonna turn up this heat just a bit because uh, I wanna make sure everything is cooked because if you cook your beef, you'll, have, you'll be having a good time. But if you don't cook your beef all the way through, consuming raw beef is not good for you. You might die. Rex tip, don't die. Now, I'm just gonna let this uh, sit in the pan for now and wait for this to finish cooking. While we do that and waiting for everything to finish, we can move on to the tomato aspect of the tomato sauce because tomato is the most important part of tomato sauce. That's why they call it tomato sauce. So I've got some diced tomatoes right here, some tomato sauce, and some tomato paste. So what I'm gonna do here, waiting for this uh, to finish up, I'm gonna pour in some diced tomatoes. Some tomato sauce. And last, I'll put in the tomato paste, which adds a very much needed texture. You can use a spoon or a wooden spatula or a rubber, sorry, rubber spatula to get those stubborn tomato paste bits out. There's quite a bit stuck in there. That should be good enough for my uses. Just give it a quick stir to make sure everything has a good time in there. There was a little party going on in there. Now I'm gonna grab my Italian seasoning while I stir. This is called multitasking for, for those uh, un unaware. I'm gonna stir while putting this in. That's, uh, that's a great amount right there. And add some, uh, some nice color, some nice green in there. Just like the, uh, the colors of the Italian flag, red, white, and green. With a little bit of brown because I spilled some coffee on the flag. I'm gonna add in some garlic powder. You can use real garlic if you like, just like the tomatoes. You can use real tomatoes if you like. This is just a lot more convenient. And there's some specific brands of garlic powder that is actually very nice. We'll go ahead and finish stirring that. Now, once your sauce is nice and ready to go, properly mixed and cooked, your noodles should be ready to be strained. Once again, I've already strained the noodles and they're ready to be cooked. So I'm gonna start building my plate. You can put in however many amount of noodles you want. I'm gonna give myself two big boy scoops because I am hungry. There's one and there's two. And then afterwards, I'm gonna start pouring on your sauce. Now this is plenty of sauce for one person. You can probably have a, have a go at it with a friend. That's, that's good. And then 
Last but certainly not least, some cheese sauce. Sorry, some Parmesan cheese. I'm just sprinkle that on. Add in however much you want. I would love to just douse this entire thing with cheese, but uh, I'm on a diet right now, and mama mia, this looks positively delectable. I can't wait to enjoy this hearty meal. Hopefully none of it ends up in my sweater. Back to you guys in the studio. Wow, that looks delicious, and such a classic meal. I'll have to try making it at home one of these days. Now let's look at the week ahead with Courtney in the METC Minute. Looking for something fun to do today later at noon in the Cooley Auditorium at the downtown campus, the first ever Florida Culture Dance event will be a live stream performance that will tell the story of the black community's impact on American dance culture. With graduation for some right around the corner, a diversity job fair on Wednesday, May 4th from noon to 4 p.m. will be at the downtown campus. 30 and 4 representing several pathways in the workforce will be in room M605. The Uniquely Abled Academy provides individuals with high-functioning autism skills needed to prepare for a CNC operator career. They are looking for students to be in the fall 2022 group. Join them Tuesday, May 3rd, 4 to 7 p.m. for the info. Plan your downtown campus transportation using the Bus Wear for Shuttles app. To get started, open the app and enter code MATC, then track Monday through Saturday routes. Lastly, motor vehicle theft continues to rise. Public safety encourages everyone to stay vigilant by exploring these theft prevention devices. Steering wheel locks, hidden kill switches, GPS trackers, or vehicle recovery systems to locate your vehicle if it's stolen. Thank you, Courtney. Those devices will surely come in handy for this summer. But today we are celebrating our planet and all that makes it beautiful. What better way to do that than to check with student producer Sam Berghammer, who has a special location in store for you that allows you to celebrate just that. I'm student producer Sam Berghammer, and this is another hidden Gem KE. This Earth Day, you could spend your time at Whitnell Park, a location that spans over 600 acres of land right in the city of Franklin. For such a large park, there is not a lack of activities at hand and sites to explore. Take a walk on Oak Leaf Trail, which has 125 miles of trail that stretches over Milwaukee County. Along the way, you can take in the luscious scenery, and you may spot some of the birds that migrate here for the spring. If you are feeling in a sporty mood, there is no shortage of that. Take your shot at the archery range, or venture around at no shortage of playgrounds. And hit the links at its very own golf course. You can visit both the Weir Nature Center, as well as Burner Botanical Garden. And if that garden isn't your type of thing, there's an alternative option the Whitnell Beer Garden. I'm gonna have to wait a little bit longer for this to open back up, but there's so much to explore. I'm Sam Berghammer, and this was another hidden Gem KE. That's incredible. I love Whitnell Park, and there's so much to do. I'll be sure to visit sometime soon. Well, that looks like it's the end of our show. I want to thank you once again for joining me, Brian, and to share all that wonderful info that you did. No problem, anytime. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us and tuning in this week. I hope you all had a great Earth Day and can continue to celebrate and help out this beautiful planet we call home. Until next time, I'm your host, Courtney Bondar, and have a great week. So.